is a Holocaust survivor and the founder and president of FARM. His experiences in the Warsaw Ghetto led him to advocate on behalf of some of the most abused and victimized members of our society, today's farmed animals. Alex is truly inspiring and I'm confident you will agree with me once you've heard his story. Please help me give a warm welcome to Dr. Alex Hershaft. All right, so I need to get a vote here. How many people are in favor of my losing the jacket? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I was in Israel recently for the past couple of weeks, and the only time I wore it was when I was visiting with the president of Israel. The rest of the time, I just sat there. But uh, <clears throat> they insisted that I had to wear a jacket on that occasion. All right, so uh, let me start uh, by thanking the Jewish Vegetarians of North America and all our sponsors for making this lecture possible. And I also want to thank you, the audience, for uh, giving me the opportunity to share my personal journey from the Warsaw Ghetto to the struggle for animal rights. I was five years old on September 1st, 1939, when the Nazi armies invaded Poland and then set up martial law. Uh, six months later, uh, my family and about 450,000 other Jews in Warsaw and surrounding areas were ordered to move into the Jewish area of uh, Warsaw. Uh, most people had to move in with strangers. We were fortunate enough that uh, my grandparents had a large apartment in a Jewish section and we were able to move in with them. Uh, eventually, we noticed that certain streets were being blocked off. There were real pieces of wall going up here and there. And uh, finally, on November 16, 1940, uh, the sections of wall were joined and uh, topped with barbed wire and the Warsaw Ghetto was formed. So again, there were about 450,000 of us crammed into an area of about uh, one and a half square miles, which in terms of population density works out to about 10 times the population density of Baltimore. Uh, so crowding and food shortages became unbearable Typhus became epidemic, with victims lining the streets. During the first year, it is estimated that between 80 and 100,000 victims uh, perished from hunger and disease. We did our best to cope with these hardships. Illegal workshops were set up to uh, manufacture clothing, which was then traded uh, outside the ghetto for food. Uh, there were also health clinics, uh, public soup kitchens, orphanages, libraries, and even a rudimentary school system. A Jewish council uh, cooperating with the Nazi authorities was responsible for first responders and uh, police. So in mid-1942, uh, the Nazis began the implementation of what they called Operation Reinhardt, which most of us today know as the final solution. Uh, between July and September, they rounded up hundreds of thousands of Jews for a two-hour uh, tr trip in cattle cars, to, mostly to Treblinka, but in some cases to Auschwitz. A key element of the operation was thorough deception to prevent a mass revolt. We were told that we're being resettled in the East, away from hunger and disease. We were told to bring along our belongings, to make sure that our name was on a suitcase in case we got separated. Uh, even the Treblinka gas chamber was decorated with the Star of David to simulate the synagogue. It is estimated that nearly a million Jews were exterminated in Treblinka, many more in Auschwitz. 
They left behind only piles of suitcases, shoes, glasses, hair, and charred bones. Silent memorials to thousands of sentient living beings who were no more. On April 19, 1943, uh, several thousand Nazi troops, backed by tanks, came in to wipe out the rest of the ghetto. <coughs> they were met with vigorous resistance that lasted four weeks. Finally, oh, and uh, uh, the date of the uprising, April 19, is celebrated throughout the wor world as <clears throat> Holocaust Day or Yom HaShoah in Hebrew. Um, sometimes on a different day according to the Jewish calendar. On May 16th, after leveling every building and massacring the survivors, Nazi General Jürgen Strop reported to Hitler that the Warsaw Ghetto was no more. I am alive today because my grandparents had two blessings. <clears throat> they had some gold jewelry and they had a living Russian maid named Yuliana. Uh, now, Yuliana spoke only Russian and she was part of the family. She had been with them for years. <clears throat> when the ghetto was formed, just as all the Jews had to move into the ghetto under penalty of death, all Gentiles had to move outside the ghetto, again, under penalty of death. Juliana refused to move. Uh, some years earlier, she, she had joined a white Russian society in order to maintain her Russian culture and language. And uh, the white Russians, were kind of uh, favored by the Germans because uh, the white Russians had fought the Bolsheviks during the Russian Revolution. They lost, obviously, and uh, they were exiled to Poland. And the Nazis expected that when they conquered Russia, the white Russians would be their puppets and the lackeys in running the country. So, Juliana went to her white Russian society and said that unless she could stay in the ghetto, uh, she would commit suicide. So she got a permit, not only to go in and out of the ghetto, but also to bring food, which was very important. And so for a while, that's what happened. She would, uh, would while we had money, she would, we would give her money, she would go out, buy food, bring it in. Eventually, we ran out of cash, so we would collect clothes from friends and neighbors. She would wrap the clothes around her body, uh, take, take the clothes outside the ghetto, and trade it for food, bring in the food, and distribute the food to the people who gave us clothes. Uh, but during the mass roundups of late 1942, Juliana got caught in one of the roundups. And so my grandmother decided that it was too dangerous for Juliana to stay even with all her permits. So there was a lot of arguing and crying. And finally, uh, Juliana agreed to leave. But only on one condition, which is that she would take me with her as her son. <clears throat> so that I would live. So my grandparents gave Juliana three batches of jewelry. The first was for the uh, Germans at the gate, so they wouldn't ask too many questions about why Juliana suddenly had a son. The second was for the hooligans who massed outside the ghetto gates for the specific purpose of extracting valuables from escaping Jews. And the third was so that Juliana could get a new start in life outside the ghetto. Of course, what she was doing was punishable by death. Smuggling a Jew outside the ghetto was 
an instant death sentence. My dad had a sister who married a Christian and she never moved into the ghetto. She was living outside. So Juliana brought me to my aunt's apartment and uh, we never saw her again. My mom and dad were able to join me a few weeks later. Uh, none of the rest of our family made it out. My aunt's partner uh, was uh, active in the Polish underground and he was able to get us false identification papers and uh, also a place to stay. And thus began a two and a half year ordeal of life hiding on the outside. A life of constant alerts to any suspicious sound statements or glances and occasional close calls. My dad lived separately from us under a different name so that if one of us got caught, the other would be implicated. I was only eight at that point, but I was properly trained to report anything out of the ordinary to my mom. So the apartment where we were staying, uh, I was playing in the yard with other kids and I overheard one of the mothers saying to the other, who is that new kid? And the other one replied, well, it's up in apartment 2B, you know, that same apartment where they took out those Jews. Uh, probably just more Jews taking their place. So I calmly stopped playing, walked up to my mom and reported. My mom packed their bags and said to the super that we were going out to the countryside because I wasn't feeling well and I needed some fresh air. The reason we were moving to the countryside was because if you moved in Warsaw, you had to register. And so they, the fact that we left suddenly would give us away immediately and they could track us through the registry. But uh, if you moved to the country, you didn't have to register. So we rented a room from a farm family and uh, came up the question of didn't have any money. We had, obviously, we were living on a farm, so there was some food, but. So my mother decided to start making trips to Warsaw to, again, trade clothing for food. So she would go to Warsaw and uh, go to the street markets and buy, food, buy uh, clothes, and then walk around all the villages with the clothes in her backpack. Uh, bringing clothes, selling clothes to the villagers. And uh, this, this went very well. And uh, eventually, the villagers started actually ordering specific items, specific size, colors, that sort of thing. And she would uh, try to satisfy them as best as she could. Uh, eventually, she made a lot of friends because she was very personable and friendly. And one time, she was going through a village and one of her friends said to her, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. Uh, you wouldn't believe this, but you know this uh, clothing store guy, uh, he never liked you because you're underselling him anyway. But uh, he actually told me that he was going to report to the Gestapo that you're Jewish. I know that's ridiculous, but I'm not concerned about that. As you know, what you're doing is obviously illegal and if they confiscate your merchandise, you have all these orders for all these people, uh, you know, it wouldn't be good. So my mother thought that was very funny and she laughed along with him and calmly walked out of sight, dropped her backpack and broke into a run. She arrived at our home, at our farmhouse uh, around midnight. Uh, she told the woman that, she had to, that we had to go to Warsaw immediately woman woke up her son and said, uh, hitch up the horses, these people need to go to the train station. Son objected, mother's very strong and uh, 
forced him to hitch up the horses to cast to the train station. We were on the way to Warsaw. Uh, the woman had two other sons uh, who had regular jobs in Warsaw. And when my mother was going back and forth, uh, she would also bring them food from, from the mother. So she knew the sons. So <clears throat> after the war, when she came back from her labor camp and found me in an orphanage, she also found the two sons. And uh, through the sons, she found the mother. And she asked her, you know, I came to you in the middle of the night, and I said I had to get to the train station. And you didn't say a word, you just acted immediately to make sure I got to the train on time. What was going through your mind? And the woman said, heck, I knew all you, along that you were Jewish. I don't care about those things. And another thing, uh, the Gestapo came about an hour after you left. So eventually, we, we all got separated uh, because of the Warsaw Uprising, which was in August of 1944, uh, about a year and a half after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, we were liberated in uh, early 1945. My mother was in a German labor camp. She came back, found me in an orphanage. Uh, we spent five years in a refugee camp in Italy, and eventually uh, I came here, my mother uh, emigrated to Israel, where she died of natural causes in 1996. Once my life was no longer in daily danger, survivor's guilt set in. The questions I kept asking is why was I spared when so many other good people were not? And how do I repay the debt for my survival? Well, the obvious question was, do good and oppression, those sort of things. But what wasn't obvious is how. So in 1961, I joined my mother in Israel for a couple of years. I launched a league to abolish religious oppression in Israel. I came back, got involved in the environmental movement, the humanist movement. I was active, but none of it really answered my question fully, which is how to repay the debt. None of it seemed sufficient. So in 1972, I moved to Washington to work for an environmental consulting firm. Uh, we were specializing in wastewater management. And they sent me to a slaughterhouse in the Midwest to do an inventory of their wastewater. So I was uh, walking through the storage areas, and suddenly I came across piles of hooves and hearts and skulls and bodies, all bearing silent testimony to the living sentient beings who were no more. I recalled in horror, as most of you would, memories of the death camp piles came flooding through my mind. I tried to dismiss it as a mere coincidence. I kept saying to myself, they're just animals. But the more I thought about it, the more I saw the inescapable similarities the branding or tattooing of serial numbers to identify the victims, the use of cattle cars to transport us to death camps, the crowded housing of victims in wood crates, the arbitrary designation of who lives and who dies. So like Christian lives, a Jew dies, a dog lives, 
a big dice. The constant vilification and abuse of the victims so that the killing would be more acceptable. The deception about the horrors behind the slaughterhouse of the dead camp walls. And as I was struggling with this dreaded comparison, I saw a quote by Nobel laureate Isaac Bashevi Singer, which said, for the animals, all men are Nazis, and life is an eternal Treblinka. And then he told me it sense. This is what I finally realized, that yes, there was a valid reason for my surviving the Holocaust. There was a valid way to repay my debt for surviving. This is when I resolved to spend the rest of my life fighting all forms of oppression, starting with the oppression of animals raised for food. The most appropriate way to honor the memory of my family and my people who perished in the Holocaust is to show that their sacrifice has not been in vain. That it has taught us some vital lessons. Lesson number one is that oppression and slaughter of Jews, Armenians, Tutsis, Bosnians, people of color, gays, and yes, the animals are all linked. And they are linked not by the identity or moral value of the victims. They are linked by one common denominator, which is the oppressive mindset. Yes, each episode of oppression is unique, particularly to its victims. Our Holocaust is unique in a systematic way that one nation attempted to eliminate another. The animal holocaust is unique in the numbers of animals, living sentient beings, who are sacrificed for our taste every single day, hundreds of millions a day. We did not end oppression when we defeated the Nazis in World War II. The lesson of the Holocaust is that we are all capable of oppressing others. And many of us actually subsidize the greatest oppression in the history of humankind whenever we shop for food. Most importantly, oppression can only survive through the silent cooperation of the public. Millions of otherwise well-meaning, upstanding Germans, Poles, were, were, were well aware about the death camps in their midst, but pretended not to notice, just as we are well aware of the slaughterhouses and the factory farms in our own neighborhoods, but pretend not to notice. As Nobel Peace Laureate Elie Wiesel said, silence favors the oppressor, never the victim. But there's an important difference. The Germans or Poles who spoke out against the Holocaust would be shot on the spot. All that we have to do is change our shopping list next time we go to the supermarket and perhaps note the change on our Facebook profile. Theologians have long debated whether there is life after death. When it comes to animals raised for food, I wonder whether there is life before death. Um, <clears throat> pigs make wonderful mothers but they never get a chance in factory farms. They're placed in these gestation stalls, barely large enough to accommodate their bodies, where they spend their entire life impregnated, biting at the bars of their stalls. 
When they're ready to give birth, they're transferred to these uh, farrowing crates where they nurse their young for about two weeks. After two weeks, their babies are torn away from them. They're castrated without any anesthesia and they're eventually placed in uh, crowded pens and sent to slaughter at the tender age of six months. Chickens raised for meat have their beaks cut off shortly after birth. They spend the rest of their lives crowded in large windowless sheds with their throats burned by ammonia and hydrogen sulfide fumes uh, from their excrements. They are fed a hormone-laden diet designed to make them grow to full market weight in only seven weeks. At the slaughterhouse, they are suspended by their legs and have their throats cut while fully conscious. Then there are the chickens raised for eggs. Have you ever wondered what happens to half of the chicks who are males and don't lay eggs? They are ground up alive or simply dumped into large plastic bags to suffocate slowly. And in a way, they're the lucky ones because they die within a few seconds or perhaps a half hour. But the females are crammed five to seven birds into small battery cages where they have about as much space per animal as this piece of paper. They are packed so tightly that they cannot move around or extend their wings. They are forced to stand on a sloping wire mesh floor that cuts into their feet, uh, while the wire mesh walls abrade their feathers and produce painful lesions. When the birds are 15 to 18 months old, their red production declines, but their bodies are too spent to be used, to have their flesh used for consumption, so they're usually just dumped or ground up for animal feed. Dairy cows are raised in large mechanized dairies with no access to the outdoors. Twice a day, they are hooked up milking machines. They are artificially inseminated and kept pregnant in order to ensure a constant supply of milk. When their babies are born, they are torn from their mothers so that humans can drink the milk that was intended for their babies. The cows search and bellow for their calves for days. But what if ending our outrageous oppression of animals were bad, were uh, good for the environment and good for our health? That would pose a real dilemma for us, wouldn't it? We would be protecting animals from oppression, but then we would be suffering from the environment and uh, our health things. Well. Let's take a look. So meat and dairy products are laden with saturated fats, cholesterol, hormones, pathogens, antibiotics, and excess protein. They lack complex carbohydrates and fiber, many essential vitamins and minerals. Consumption of animal products has been linked conclusively with increased risk of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, stroke, and several types of cancer. Conversely, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes supply all essential nutrients, protein, carbohydrates, fiber, antioxidants, and a variety of beneficial phytonutrients, which reduce the risk of heart disease and stroke. Plant-based foods contain little saturated fats, no cholesterol, no 
on drugs. Animal agriculture is more devastating to our natural environment than all other human activities combined. The devastation impacts land, water, air, and wildlife. Animals raised for food in the U.S. produce 150 times the amount of waste that people do. The waste is stored in huge open cesspools which overflow into our uh, water supplies during rains, thunderstorms. According to a report by the United Nations, animal agriculture generates 18% of man-made greenhouse emissions, more than transport, and more recent calculations indicate that the contribution may be closer to 50%. Animal agriculture has been turning lush forests in, and prairies into barren deserts. The process begins with clear cutting of trees to create pastures for cattle, and eventually the Pastures become overgrazed and they're plowed under to create uh, feed crops for uh, animals. Deuteronomy proclaims, I have given you life and death, blessings and curses. Therefore, choose life so that you and your children may live. Indeed, my friends, every time we shop for food, we make a choice between subsidizing life and subsidizing death. We can choose animal products with their deadly impacts on animals, on our health, and the health of our planet. Or we can choose, or we can choose healthy, life-affirming foods. Those of you who wonder about protein, plants offer a huge selection of protein sources. Those of you who crave uh, the texture and taste of meat, cheese, milk, yogurt, ice cream, alternatives are available in every supermarket. And some people have told me that I should point out the fact that uh, I have been a vegan for nearly 40 years. I'm 80 years old and I'm in excellent health. So, so it, it, it couldn't be too bad for me. So once again, I want to thank you for this opportunity to share my journey from the Warsaw Ghetto to advocacy for veganism and animal rights. I hope that you will join me. Uh, here are a few celebrities who have already come along. And now uh, it's questions and answers and pledge time. No, I'm not asking for money. Uh, but uh, on your seats, you will find the pledge sheets where the Jewish vegetarians of North America are asking you to pledge a certain number of vegan days per week. I recognize many of you in the audience. I know you're already doing this. But for those of you who are new to the concept, uh, please give it a try, and uh, I think you'll like it. So we're open to questions, comments. No hacking, please. So uh, uh, when you speak of children, 
Uh, the, the major problem with children is that they are natural vegans anyway. Uh, the reason they consume animal products is because their parents insist on it. And we have the same problem when we try to approach children. We have to deal with angry letters from parents. So we generally start at age 14, uh, between 14 and 24. Uh, and uh, the reason we start with that age group is what well, the two main, three main reasons. One is that uh, they uh, are old enough where they can make their own decisions about their diet. And yet they're young enough where their mind is still open to dietary changes. The third reason is that uh, they happen to gather in, in large numbers at rock concerts and college campuses, so we have easy access to them. But uh, that's, that's the story with children. Is that, does that help? Sort of. Yeah, sort I'd like of. to be able to get into the schools or, or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah, so apparently, yeah, I just came back from a speaking tour of Israel, and apparently in Israel that's being done regularly. They do they get to speak in schools. We haven't had very much luck with that here, but uh, we need to find out how they do it. <laughs> uh, I think there was, uh, you, yeah? Hi, uh, my daughter-in-law is the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. She has made very humane outreach to animals who are injured, close to death and dying, that have been treated inhumanely, unfairly, and mistreated. And she has taught me a lot. So my question is exceedingly difficult to ask because I believe every fiber in my being that this is essential for caring for the earth and our planet, its animals and wildlife, its vanishing bee populations, and the rest of us. What will happen and what kind of sustainable practices, humane treatment of animals will be in place if and when the world becomes vegan? Will we end animal husbandry and put all these animals that have been suffering to death or is their life after the living death for these animals? So I think the question was, uh, if we stop eating animals, what would happen to them? Well, mostly they wouldn't exist because we wouldn't be breeding them. Today, the number of animals that exist in factory farms uh, gets adjusted every few months, depending on uh, the prospects for their uh, sale. So this is a very dynamic process. Remember these animals are slaughtered while they're still infants. So like chickens are slaughtered at seven weeks, pigs are slaughtered at six months. So there's a constant up and down in the production as they to match the demand. So there would not be a problem with uh, animals running around when we become vegans. Yeah, Bruce. About your trip to Israel and how you found the movement there, and any impressions yeah. or anything else you want to share about that? Because a lot of us were really. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, th this was kind of a surprise. Uh, it actually, it actually started with a lecture I did for Jewish vegetarians of North America in Pittsburgh last year. Some people heard it and. Uh, some people in Israel heard it, and they uh, uh, they posted it on YouTube and uh, put Hebrew subtitles on, and uh, this impressed a lot of people. And this idea came up that I should come and speak in person. Uh, so I did uh, between May third and May twelfth. I just came back last Wednesday. And uh, I was, uh, I gave four lectures at the four major universities and also six intense two-hour seminars for individual activists <clears throat> and also participated in two demonstrations. So it was, it was very, very active 10 days and uh, 
got a lot of publicity, including the cover and center spread of the largest newspaper in Israel, Yediyot Akronot, got on two, two TV shows. Anyway, a lot of publicity. Uh, I was very impressed with the quality of the activists who basically coordinated my tour. The movement is composed of about, oh, roughly, probably under a hundred activists, and then many more sort of on the fringes who are not fully engaged. And it's a very young movement. In some ways, I mean, the, the movement goes back to probably around roughly 20 years or so, but it got a huge boost from a lecture that was given by a gentleman who is not very well known in this country, but is extremely well known in Israel by the name of Gary Urofsky. Uh, you know him? Okay. <laughs> Okay, he's, uh, he's, he, be, he became a sensation in Israel even before he showed up. So there again, uh, this, the same group that publicized my talk did the same thing for the talk that Gary gave in Atlanta some four or five years ago. So three years ago they put Hebrew subtitles on his talk and uh, put it on their YouTube channel and promoted it throughout the country as the best video you have ever seen. And uh, many, if not most, of the activists who sponsored, who coordinated my talk can date back their veganism to watching that original lecture by Gary Yurovsky. Gary subsequently visited Israel twice, but his initial impact was through that one video that he did in, back in Atlanta that many of us have seen. Uh, the, since then, there have been, so, so basically, in a sense, like, so veganism kind of became very popular in Israel since that lecture, since that video lecture, basically. So in that sense, veganism as a popular notion is about three years old. And since then, a number of restaurants have either become vegan or are offering vegan options. The food is excellent. What else? <laughs> it's, a, it's very, uh, I was very, very impressed. I was impressed. Uh, they, they do have established organizations. It's not all volunteer. They do have a number of established organizations, but a lot of people are volunteering. It's, it's a little bit like we were in the 1980s before all the big organizations uh, were started or became big. Very exciting. Uh, yes, back then. Speaking of Israel, I had heard something a couple of years ago, and I wondered if you had heard of it or knew if it went anywhere. A friend sent me an article that a man from the Turin Karfa, of all places, was bringing up the idea that we have to, he probably is not advocating for vegetarianism, but is advocating that we have to be careful how we treat animals before they're slaughtered, and talking about factory farming as being Sarban and and I had never heard of, of you know, I, they are extremely religious, as you know. I'm observant myself, but I don't feel I have too much in common with them. But I was thrilled to know that someone from that background would even be raising this issue. And I don't know how far he got, or I never really heard about it again. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I, I don't know about that one individual, but uh, there is uh, there is a gentleman who is, uh, who has a, video with Hebrew subtitles where he basically addresses the, the Bible. And he goes through every item in the Bible and shows why the Bible tells us to be vegans. 
and uh, the, uh, this just happened like uh, two, three weeks ago that the video went public. And uh, activists I spoke to were very excited about, about this because, as you may know, the religious people basically run the country right now, or they have been for a while. So having some inroads in their religious community would be very, very helpful. Israel is a very regulated country. Uh, right now, uh, the one reason that veganism is doing so well is because the government is looking on it with favor. Uh, so if we can get the religious parties to play a more active role, that would just benefit the movement so much more. Yes, back there. More on the matter of religiosity and uh, veganism, um, I find two polarities in uh, interpreting Jewish text. One is uh, is uh, taking an overabundance of caution, um, kinitio during uh, Passover, for instance, and one is uh, circumvents what is self-evidently the spirit of the law, um, Shabbat elevators, for instance, and our roofs. And uh, it seems that kosher slaughter, uh, humane slaughter, uh, falls in that latter uh, um, method of interpretation. Is it simply a matter of shifting the priority into uh, interpreting uh, Jewish views on animals and uh, treatment of animals with an overabundance of caution um, in the spirit of, of, uh, of the Torah rather than, than how, it's, uh, how allowances are made, if, if you follow. Uh, okay. Uh, was that a Meaning that there's a strict interpretation of, of Jewish law and there's one that circumvents, circumvents Jewish law, uh, uh -huh. Shabbat elevators, for instance, and with the symbol edict, uh, there are Hasidic communities that have banned the use of uh, Shabbat elevators and Arabs, for instance. So I'm uh, of the mind that with a simple edict from a Hasidic leader or Hasidic community, uh, veganism can simply be uh, um, impressed upon the community. All right, thank you. Is that not the case? I, uh, that that was not a question, I presume. I was looking for your uh, views on that, if, if that's um, the case. I, that's outside my area of expertise. Oh. But uh, it seems to me that the laws of Kashrut are very concerned with the treatment of animal. I mean, as far as I know, which is limited in this area, uh, if the animal has been harmed in any way, that animal cannot be slaughtered in a kosher manner. I don't know if that helps. Well, all kinds of hands, sub experts, yeah. Uh, you speak to people all over the world. I want to ask you, what do you think is the biggest misconception about the Holocaust and about you in particular, about the Holocaust survivors mm -hmm. that you encountered in the media? Yeah. Uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting because I found out that one of the reasons I was invited was because all these activists have, were very frustrated in dealing with their parents and grandparents in uh, drawing comparison between the Jewish Holocaust and the animal Holocaust. And they were hoping that I would uh, have an impact. So a lot of them brought their parents and grandparents to my lectures. But uh, the, the gist of my answer to your question is that uh, the comparison I make is not about the victims, the identity of the victims. It is about the oppressive mindset. And the danger of focusing on the victims is that uh, it can lull us into thinking that we have ended oppression because we defeated the Nazis. And uh, we haven't. Oppression goes on, oppression of people and oppression of animals goes on right now. Um, so, <clears throat> to me, it's uh, sort of repeating myself. To me, it's very important that we honor the memory of the Holocaust, the Jewish Holocaust, by making sure that we have learned some lessons from it. Now, other people may have le learned different lessons, but we should not just 
have this uh, a lot of people in Israel in particular kind of dwell in this worship of victimhood you know they, they have this special status because they have suffered and which is fine I, I'm, I'm not denying them that they certainly deserve it but I think there's a great danger for the rest of us if uh, if we do that because we then become insensitive to the oppression that we ourselves are causing to others. Yes. I, I have a, my question is about your personal story. Um, I'm vegan and very much an activist. Uh, you um, said that your parents joined you mm -hmm. um, in the Warsaw ghetto when you were staying outside, the, yeah. outside the ghetto. How did your parents get out? Right. Is my first question. And you mentioned your mother, but not your father. Yeah, well, uh, my mother uh, uh, got out, uh, they, they used to send uh, work details outside the ghetto to do jobs that Poles wouldn't do, you know, garbage, that sort of thing. So, uh, of course, under escort. So, my, my mother knew about this ahead of time, and uh, she put on her best clothes and uh, went out on one of those details. And then uh, when she was passing uh, an alleyway, uh, they have these, well, if, you have, if you haven't seen Poli old Polish houses, they have these gateways. And so as they were turning the corner, she ducked into one of those gateways, took off her armband, which identified her as a Jew. And then uh, walked around calmly, watching store windows, pretending to belong. Never found out how my father got out. The reason I talk about my mother and not my father was because uh, my father perished shortly after the uprising, and we don't know how. Yes, Aaron. Um, do you know anything about the treatment of animals during the Holocaust? Um, I was particularly wondering about what happened to people's families when um, they were forced to areas. Yeah, I suspect they were eaten, but I'm not sure. I, I didn't, I don't remember seeing any animals in the ghetto. Yes? So, yeah. so, yeah. so I would okay. So I would ask the person. Okay, here's a country that uh, gave rise to some of the greatest musicians, and composers, and authors, and philosophers and scientists in the world. Uh, <clears throat> only a decade before, and. Uh, are now spawning the, the great, one of the greatest countries in the world today, only a decade later. Uh, people were not born Nazis or oppressors. They were formed into it. And that's something that we're all capable of doing. And uh, you know, there are lots of examples, uh, even, even in even if you're only concerned about humans, uh, things we've done during the Vietnam War to the Vietnamese killed probably several million Vietnamese civilians with napalm fire bombing, and then of course attacked against animals in this country. So, comparing someone with a Nazi, now we're we're not comparing anyone with a Nazi. Just like every Victimhood is unique, so is every oppressive mindset unique. Nazis were oppressive in their way, and we're oppressive in our way. 
there was some, yeah. I was really interested in your business with the modern house. Do you And I was curious to know if you would be willing to expand on what your thoughts were when you visited the slaughterhouse. And I'm curious about what your relationship was with animals before you went to the slaughterhouse, and maybe how, um, just expanding on that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I sort of described my reaction. It was, you know, I wasn't really anticipating seeing that. I was just inspecting the storage areas and trying to do uh, inventory of their wastewater management problems and coming across these these piles was really shocking. Uh, I had been uh, a vegetarian already but I that was strictly a personal decision it wasn't uh, about the animals it was actually more of an aesthetic decision it was just the whole concept of taking a beautiful living breathing being and heading him over the head and cutting up his body into little pieces and shoving the little pieces into my mouth it's always seemed kind of disgusting so uh, this was long before i knew about the treatment of animals long before i knew about the environment long before i knew about the health aspects so i wasn't really thinking it was more a matter of what I put in my mouth than anything else. So, mm. so the idea of seeing these body parts was really shocking. Mm. I think we've confused everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you made it very clear. <laughs>